In this example problem, we're going to calculate the nominal flexural strength of the section shown using the ACI 318 procedure with the rectangular stress block and the equation given in the code for calculating the stress in the pre-stressing strands. We have six half inch diameter strands and you can see some of the uh, required material and suction properties shown over here. Our first step is to calculate the stress in the pre-stressing strands at ultimate strength. We have this equation given here in the code, which simplifies down if we don't have any non-pre-stress reinforcement. So if we don't have any non-pre-stress reinforcement, we can knock off some terms and we'll get this equation that I show here. So some of the terms that we'll need, uh, we'll need a gamma sub P factor, which is a, a factor for the type of pre-stressing that we have. And here uh, we need to calculate the ratio of our yield strength to the ultimate strength for our pre-stressing, which is typically going to be 0.9 or higher. So we'll typically have a gamma sub P factor of 0 0.28. Next, we need to find our pre-stressing ratio. And our pre-stressing ratio is going to be the ratio of our total pre-stress area divided by B, which will be the width of our compression face, which in this case is B sub F of 24 inches, times D sub P, the distance from the compression fiber to the centroid of all of our strands. We have two layers of strands here, but we're given the centroid to the center of those two layers to be equal to 20 inches, so we'll use that value. Plug, plugging in our values then, we have 0 0.918 square inches divided by 24 times 20 gives us a pre-stressing ratio of 0 0.00191. Next, we need to find our beta 1 factor, our rectangular stress block factor. Uh, we have 6 KSI concrete. Plugging in 6 KSI into our beta 1 equation, we can get a beta 1 equal to 0.75. Finally, we can plug all these values into our equation for our F sub PS. So the stress in the strand at ultimate F sub PS is going to be equal to 270 KSI times one minus 0.28 divided by 0.75 times 0 0.00191 times 270 KSI divided by 6 KSI. So we'll get F sub PS equal to 261.3 KSI. So this is the stress in the strand at ultimate strength, at our nominal moment capacity. Our step two is to calculate the rectangular stress block depth A using equilibrium. So we can look at our strain and stress diagrams like we have before. And the only force components that we'll have are from our concrete and compression, our compression block, and the tension in our pre-stressing strands, which will be equal to A sub PS times F sub PS. If we look at our equilibrium expression, we can see we don't have any external applied load, so we can set our compression forces equal to our tension forces, and we can solve for A, our compression block depth, and we'll get a compression block depth equal to our area pre-stressing 0.918 square inches times the stress in the strands at ultimate 261.3. Divided by 0.85 times the compression or the width of our compression block, which is equal to 24 inches, times the strength of our concrete 6 KSI. So we'll get an A here equal to 1.96 inches. We need to check to make sure that this compression block falls within our top flange because we have a T section. So we need to check to see that A is less than the thickness of our flange, which is six inches. So we can see 
1.96 is less than 6, so we know that our compression block's in the top flange, so we're okay here. We can next calculate our C, which our C, we take our A divided by beta 1 to get a C of 2.61, and we'll need this later in this example. Finally, we can calculate our nominal moment here. So our nominal moment, is, we're going to sum our moments about the centroid of our compression block. So our tension force is equal to our area of pre-stressing, 0.918 square inches, times the stress in the strand at ultimate, 261.3 KSI, times our lever arm here, which will be 20 inches DP, minus A over 2, 1.96 divided by 2. And this will give us uh, MN equal to 4,562 kip inches. So here's our, our nominal, uh, nominal moment. We need to check the strain in our pre-stressing steel to see if we're tension controlled, compression controlled, or in the transition between the two regions. ACI allows you to check the strain in the outermost or, or bottommost layer of strands. So we would use D sub T here. We're not given D sub T in this example. So we're just going to use D sub P. And you can see the strain at the centroid of all of our strands is going to be less than the strain in the strands of the outer, they're the bottommost strands. So if we are tension controlled here, then we'll also be tension controlled with our bottom strands. So let's go ahead and find this strain. So the strain here, E sub CP is going to be equal to 0 0.003 times 20 inches minus our C, which we found to be 2.61 inches, all divided by 2.61 inches, which will give us a strain here equal to 0 0.020. We can compare this to our, our tension, control, tension controlled strain, which will be epsilon TY plus 0 0.003 where when we have pre-stressing reinforcement, our epsilon TY is going to be equal to 0 0.002. So our tension controlled strain is equal to 0 0.005. We can see that our, our strain in our pre-stressing is greater than this value, so we'll be tension controlled here. Because we're tension controlled, we'll use a phi equal to 0.9. So our factored nominal moment capacity will be 0.9 times our nominal moment, which will be equal to 4,106 kip inches. If we were doing design, we would need to make sure that our factored nominal moment is greater than our uh, demand along the entire length of the beam. Uh, we're not given any information on the loading, so we're not going to do that check here. In the next part of this example, we're going to see what happens if we increase our area of our pre-stressing and decrease the thickness of our flange. So we're going to look at the revised section that's shown here, where we have twice as much pre-stressing and our, flange, our top flange thickness is half what we had before, or three inches. So going through this quickly, we can find our pre-stressing ratio the same way that we did in uh, the previous part of this example. So take our, our total pre-stress area divided by the width of our compression face times the depth of our strands. So we'll get a, a pre-stressing ratio there. And then we can use that with our other values to calculate our stress in our strand uh, at ultimate, or at the nominal moment. So F sub PS equal to 252.6 KSI. We can then use our equilibrium expression that we did earlier to calculate our compression block depth. So we'll see our compression block here to be 3.79 inches. And we can compare that to the thickness of our flange, which here is three inches. So we can see our A is greater than the thickness of our flange, three inches. So our compression block is extending out of the top flange and into the web. So we need to analyze our section a little different. So that's what we'll do on the next, next couple slides. Because our compression block is extending out of our flange and into our web, we're going to break our compression block region up into two different areas. Uh, the first will be the area 
that's just in our top flanges. So this A sub F. And the other area is going to be here, the area in the web extending to the top of the beam. And that'll have a, a width of BW and a height of A. So you can see here, I, I calculate our flange area for us. So six inches, the flange height times 24 minus 12, the distance just right here. So two times that distance that I just highlighted. And we'll get a flange area of 72 square inches. Our web area is going to be dependent on our compression block depth, which will keep our compression block uh, depth as a variable here, because we don't, we don't know it at this point. Plugging in these different areas into our equilibrium expression, we can calculate, uh, or is what we do right here, and A is going to be our only unknown, so we can solve for A, as I do here. Plugging in all of our known values, we can find an A equal to 4.58 inches. And we can again check to make sure that we're extending past the top flange, which is what we're assuming in this analysis. So we just need to make sure here that our A is greater than our, our uh, flange thickness, three inches, which it is here. So we're, we're okay with our assumption there. We can also check our neutral axis depth the same way that we did before, taking our A divided by beta one, giving us a C of 6.1 inches. And we can find our, our nominal moment the same way that we did before. The only difference is uh, we're going to sum our moments about the centroid of our web uh, region there. So we're also going to have a, a force and a lever arm for the uh, area and force provided by our, our flange regions here. So we need to include the force coming from those regions. So that's what we're doing here. We have the force coming from the flange region and the lever arm, the distance between the center of the flange region and the centroid of our web region. So adding that to our uh, tension force from our pre-stressing and the lever arm there, we'll get a total moment here of 8,360 kip inches. We also need to check to make sure that we're, uh, we're tension controlled here. We can use the strain diagram again and calculate the strain in the pre-stressing, excluding any locked in uh, pre-stressing strain and see that we're tension controlled. So we'll use a phi of 0.9 and taking that 0.9 times our, our MN, we'll get a factored nominal moment here of 7,524 kip inches. On this slide, I show us a comparison between our rectangular stress block approach and uh, results that we would get from a, an analysis with response 2000. You can see here on the left, we have our base example problem with our six pre-stressing strands and six inch top flange thickness. And on the right, we have the second part of our example where we doubled our pre-stressing, where we have those 12 strands, and then we have half the, the top flange thickness of three inches. You can see uh, response gives us an output of where the compression block is falling at different points. And here at the ultimate strength, you can see the compression block is falling in the top flange only for the first part of the example. And then when we doubled the amount of pre-stressing and decreased the thickness of our top flange, now we have our compression block falling in our web like we found in our calculations. You can see here uh, the moment curvature diagrams for our, our two different parts. And you can see that when we increase the amount of pre-stressing steel uh, and also make it so the the uh, compression block falls in the web. We do increase capacity, but we also are decreasing the ductility, ductility of our section. So that's, you know, if we increase our steel and uh, have our, our uh, compression block fall into our web, um, we're going to decrease our ductility. So uh, you can see the results here comparing our rectangular stress block to our response 2000. And essentially within, we're within five or 10%. So it, it's a, a reasonable, or we're, we're better than that. We're within 5%. So uh, it's a reasonable approach, um, or the rectangular stress block approach is a reasonable way to uh, estimate the ultimate capacity. That concludes this example.